Yeah, well, there should be someone. We're in the midst of discussing uh, how to put up our web papers. Um, there should be someone there, namely Jesse. But if not Jesse, then ask Marjorie Chadwick, the director, who will be there, who can help you. Obviously, we want Jesse or Corbin, but there might be someone else who could. And William, you're still working on yours as well. Okay, it's not a technical issues for you. Okay, we'll try to get it up by the end of the or the end of the weekend. Anyway, we've just opened it up because my other class had more technological difficulties than you all, for whatever reason. Um, yeah, Anne. Uh, can someone give me a good place to look at the proper MLA? That was on the sheet that was given to us. Yeah, DianaHacker.com. Diana I didn't get to that. I'll try it. DianaHacker.com. Let's, what, let me, um, Anne, are you the only person suffering from this question? I was. <laughs> okay. Let's us work it out. And Tracy, are you, you're on top of this issue? You got into Diana, it's on the paper that was given us, yeah. And you had no trouble. It's also on the visa. It might be your individual web settings, too. And what were you saying? It's also on the website. On the Vista website. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, if you continue to have trouble, email Jesse or Corbin, and you you have their emails. Our helpers. Or, Oh, it's Mary is the one who handed us that day in class the piece of paper with the website. But if it's on the Vista site, that's pretty easy. So, okay, good. So, um, thank you. If anybody didn't fill out a um, evaluation sheet on the web project on Tuesday, could you come up and I'll give you an evaluation sheet after class? After class, don't forget, Kathy. I want your input. Um, it's been interesting to see how we can make this project uh, better, and I think we will eventually. So nonetheless, I was gratified that many of you found it to be a useful enterprise. So now, on our syllabus, I had assigned you, and we've kind of ignored it till today, an essay by David Mickix on Derek Walcott and Alejo Carpentier. And I just, I'm not asking you, I'm not going to hold you responsible for it. We have just got so much work to do in the next month. But I wanted to point out, nonetheless, a couple of pages and passages that seem to me to be useful. As you know, David Mickix is my colleague in the English department. Some of you will have taken his courses. He's a wonderful scholar. And I assign his essay, it's one of the essays in this anthology that's really become part of the um, let's say, general discussion of Caribbean literature. As you may know, Derek Walcott, Nobel Prize winner in, I guess, about 19, does anybody know for sure, 1993 or so, a, a great poet. I'll have to look up that date and get it to you for sure. But Derek Walcott writes in English. His, he is from the Antilles. You remember my uh, schematic map from Tuesday. He happens to be from the island of St. Lucia. And he's very identified with Afro-Caribbean culture and yet with Anglophone high British culture as well. So he does a bit, and, and Carpentier is an avowed influence of his. So what David Mickix does in his essay is look at both of them together and see how the Anglophone and the Hispanophone um, writers, that is the writer of English and the writer in Spanish, uh, negotiate the multiculturalism of the Caribbean. So let me just, if I may, signal some page numbers. And then when you're preparing for the final exam and you're wanting to think a little bit more about the kingdom of this world, which will feature, of course, largely in the final, it's a very important text for our purposes, you might want to take a look at David's argument. Um, on page 372, which is the uh, at the outset, this is the second page of his essay, he does what we've been doing. He's talking about how the magic and the real are not 
contradictory but complementary. He speaks of a paradoxical relationship, and I think that's useful to think in terms of para a paradox. What is a paradox but a contradiction in terms, but yet the contradiction exists uh, Nonetheless, it's not that one side of the paradox overwhelms the other. So the cultural mixings of the Caribbean, he argues, and this he says on page 374, is a source of invention whose energy derives from the conjunctions and cross influences of radically different modes of thought and life. That's the kind of thing we've been seeing and will continue to see, the cultural clashes in the Caribbean. I like his formulation, though, and I'll say it one more time, that that cultural mixings, those cultural mixings become a source of invention whose energy derives from the conjunctions and cross influences of radically different modes of thought and life. He doesn't uh, really focus so much on culture in this particular moment of his essay, but on different modes of thought and life. And then he goes ahead and for several pages talks about Derek Walcott's work and arrives in interesting ways on about page 270. Well, let's see, he, he, it's really until two, three, sorry, three, I'm saying two, if I said two, it's all 300, uh, it begins on 372, and by 383, page 383, he's getting to the part that will interest you as you review for your final, I think, um, which is a discussion of the kingdom of this world. And here, again, he's, he's playing with that paradox, that ox, oxymoron, another nice word that you English uh, folks will know, O-X-Y-M-O-R-O-N, contradiction in terms, an oxymoron of the Western European and the Afro-Caribbean cultures. And of course we're seeing that, aren't we, in our novel, and I want to finish up with T. Noel and uh, the Haitian context of, of the novel we're reading. But so here, a couple things to note. He, sp he speaks, he, David is really looking throughout at the relation of nature as regenerative, the land, Latin American essential territory, and history, which is a history of colonization, a history of violence. So they, he, says, he says nature for both of these writers represents both a risk and an attraction. That we can say, wow, as authors, let's get away from this tyrannical co colonizing history, and we've seen it explicitly in the kingdom of this world, and let's think about nature as regenerative, a kind of romantic move, if you want. If you study the romantic poets, you know they do just that, Wordsworth, uh, Coleridge, et al., in the English tradition. So he, he's balancing in his discussion of the kingdom of this world the resources of nature as opposed to the unresources, the, the dis advantages of colonizing history. And what he comes to the conclusion of, and we'll see it at the end of this novel when we talk about it in a minute, is that finally, no matter how much one hopes for a kind of regenerative vision of Latin American place, that the cycles of tyranny continue. And we see it with Henri Christophe, and we see it with the, the those who take over from the French, put on the same the freed slaves who put on the army jackets and the, the uniform of the French colonizers and begin to oppress their own people. That's the kinds of ironies, that, the kind of irony, historical irony, the cyclical violence that we are treated to in the novel uh, The Kingdom of This World. That doesn't stop the fact, you won't stop I mean, you, this doesn't impede your noticing that the end of the, the kingdom of this world is T. Noel out there in a nice little kind of nest that he's created for himself from the wreckage of the revolution, uh, finding indeed some consolation in, in history. So that balancing of the tyrannies, the, the, the tyrannical cycles of history against a natural context that seems to offer some possibility of regeneration. And so, I want you then, if you want to, to look at David's argument starting, as I said, pages 383 and forward, where he talks about the kingdom of this world and how personages, that is the characters of the fiction and this novel in particular, are bound to the violent colonial past even after the revolution of independence. And so, as you know, because you, when you've 
I mean, because you've read the, the novel. One more point that I thought was interesting was this business of the bondage to the past. You know, the colonial, the French colonizing forces are defeated by the mythic power of the gods and the uh, some charismatic um, Afro-Haitian leaders, um, but that we suddenly see them wearing the uniforms of the colonizers. So that, as I said, that irony of an independence movement that finally doesn't free the disenfranchised uh, masses. But nonetheless, we see T. Noel at the end finding a way to survive. So I just then, that's a very cursory look at that essay. You, you may not be interested in particular in the section on Walcott, though if you're interested in great poetry, I think you'll, you'll find it, it very interesting. He's uh, a poet, I mean, as I said, Nobel Prize winner, not for nothing. He's an epic poet of the region, working toward a kind of cross-cultural, um, paradoxical paradigm for identity in the Caribbean, as is Carpentier from his uh, Cuban perspective. So let's finish off then this novel, and I do want to hear from you all, but if we could continue our little march through the, no through the novel. I sensed last time I was just talking you s sort of numb, uh, s but I want to keep on at least while I've got you here and aren't quite numb yet. <laughs> because remember, we were following T. Noel. He's the focus of the, of the novel, and we had seen him be one in a gambling match from his French master by a, Spa uh, by a Cuban person, a Cuban master he, we saw in that part three that he, no, part two, that he goes to Cuba. Then we're going to watch now. We got him to Cuba. He, he, things were better for him in Cuba. Remember, we, watched, we read the passage where he's looking at the Spanish Baroque church, the Christ with the real hair, and so forth. He said he feels more akin, in a way, to that kind of represented religion than he does or did in Haiti. But then we see him go back to Haiti. This is the Cuban novelist Carpentier interested in the links between French and Cuban colonization in the, in ha in the Caribbean. And how, what is that link? It's Afro-Caribbean culture. It's the beliefs of the, in the African slaves form the sub <coughs> substratum of this, of, of the Caribbean, whether it's colonized by the French or colonized by the Spanish. And of course, Haiti, as we know, uh, a part of the, an island that is now precisely divided between Spanish speakers and French speakers, that Hispaniola always contested, really, b between Spanish and, and French. But we're seeing the moment of the, the, tr the triumph of the African-American or the Afro-Caribbean troops. And I want to just point to that page 103, where finally the French are routed. The gods of the African slaves triumph. And that's how it's understood by the African slaves, that their gods have finally imposed themselves. It's not that they've done it themselves. Heavens no, they are absolutely assisted by the great Loas. So if you look at page 103 in the middle, there's that sentence that begins, now the great Loas smiled upon the Negro's arms. Do you find it? Their weapons, obviously. Victory went to those who had warrior gods to invoke. Ogun Badagri guided the cold steel charges against the last redoubts of the goddess reason. Now that goddess reason, of course, refers to the French Revolution. We've talked about that um, last time. The, the French Revolution was the triumph of the Enlightenment. No more church, no more religion. We're, we're all encyclopedists. We're Voltaire. We're cynical about religion. Remember, we already saw where Pauline, Pauline Bonaparte says to herself as she's using Soliman's remedies to cure, which doesn't work, her husband, General Leclerc, she says, why did I go so much with the fashion of the day? In other words, where are beliefs now that I need them? So now we're seeing the perspective of the um, African, the slave, Uprising. Victory went to those who had warrior gods to invoke. Ogun Badagri guided the cold steel charges against the last redoubts of the goddess reason, the French. 
And as in all combats deserving of memory because someone had made the sun stand still or brought down walls with a trumpet blast, in those days there were men who covered the mouths of the enemy cannon with their bare breasts and men who had the power to deflect leaden bullets with, from their bodies. It was then that there appeared about the countryside Negro priests, untonsured and unordained, who were known as the fathers of the savannah. So you see the African culture now taking over. When it came to praying in Latin at the palate of the dying, they were as learned as the French priests. But they made themselves better understood, for they recited the Lord's Prayer or the Hail Mary. When they recited the Lord's Prayer or the Hail Mary, they gave the words accents and inflections that made them like other hymns everyone knew. They have converted the Catholic Latin prayers into a language that's understandable. In other words, it's this per perfect syncretism. What we have to imagine is that they're praying in the language of Africa, of the, of the slaves. At last, certain, at, at last, certain matters of life and death were being taken care of in the family. So you, that's a very, I mean, this novel it does so much to be so compressed. You know, in that paragraph, we see the, con, the, the reversal of fortune of the French. We see the taking over of the slaves by taking over of their colonized history. What we're going to see, however, as we've already said, and you know it from reading the book, is that the cycles are going to continue to cycle. Uh, it's not the... Um, not the independence that one would have hoped. So there, there's that. Now, if you turn to page 109, we, well, the return to Haiti is actually part three. We see, um, if you just look at the, no, chapter one, it's 107. Um, chapter one of part three, we see T. Noel find his way back to, to Haiti. Um, we're told in the first few sentences there, it was a long time now since the day a Santiago plantation owner had won him in a card game by calling Monsieur Le Normand de Mézy's bet. The latter had died soon after. Under his Cuban owner, T. Noel's existence had been much more bearable, and so forth. So we're getting this cross-colonial perspective as well as cross-cultural. But you'll remember pages, we don't have to read it all, but 108 and 109, Tino is glad to be back home. Even though his Cuban master treated him better than his French master in Haiti, he's glad to be back to his own territory. At the middle of 109, we're told Tino fell to his knees and gave thanks to heaven for allowing him the joy of returning to the land of the great Pat. Now, one more time, we're going to see this notion of the gods behind the Negro victory. For he knew, and all the French Negroes of Santiago de Cuba knew, that Dessalines, he's a, a, a black general, Dessalines' victory was the result of a vast coalition entered into by Loco, Petro, Ogun, Ferrai, Brise, Pamba, and so forth. All deities of powder and fire. A coalition of gods, right? Marked by a series of seizures in a violence so fearful that certain men had been thrown into the air or dashed against the ground by the spells. Then the blood, the gunpowder, and so forth, and the sacred drums throbbing, and so forth. So, you know, this reminds us a little too much of certain holy wars that are part of our own experience, um, the kind of, of belief systems that allow um, such, such things. But in a way, our sympathies in this novel are with, of course, the African populations of Haiti. Or we sympathize with T. Noel. We're glad that somehow he has gods of war that can defeat, defeat the colonizing forces, even though, as we've said now 50 times, not for long. So, okay, so you see that, remember how on page 113, he sees a beautiful palace, and that is Sans Souci. The palace that the now king, Henry Christophe, African 
Haitian king has built for himself. It doesn't take long for the leaders of the masses to forget about the masses. So we see this description, the bottom of 113 through 114 and 15, of this beautiful palace, Sans Souci, that's been built, the white colonnades. It's totally Europeanized architecture. And so what happens at the end of this? He's, he's, he's enslaved. He's impressed into service. Remember, he's bonked on the head and given a brick and told to work on the Citadel La Ferrière that Henri Christophe is, is constructing. So we lose, after 117, we lose him as a thread. We go, in fact, back to Europe. This novel goes back and forth. We really should, maybe on the final, I'll ask you to chart the places, the backs and forths. Carpentier loves that. His characters are always zipping over to Europe and zipping back to, but here, uh, they're really between Cuba, Haiti, and what we see as Paris, we see, if you, as you remember, um, the wife and daughters of Henri Christophe in Paris, there with Soliman, who reappears. And there's a very famous scene where, remember at night, he's walking among the statues of white, um, white women, of course, um, and he remembers Pauline Bonaparte. Do you remember it? Um, and he begins to massage the white marble statue. And there's this kind of m moment where he, um, it, look at once, it's, it's further ahead, it's 164 and 165, jump up to that place. This is, it's a moment of great humor, actually. There are funny things about this, this novel with this misunderstanding, this constant misunderstanding of one culture by the other. But we're, we're in, it seems to me, well, we're in Europe and it seems to me Paris. I've forgotten how I located that for sure. But we see, th oh no, it's Rome. I'm sorry, we're told it's Rome. I beg your pardon. Um, if you look at 163, about six lines down on that middle paragraph, that the two rows of superimposed columns framed the patio, casting the outline of their capitals halfway up the walls. And then we see this description of the statues. They were all of naked women, although all wore veils in an imaginary breeze coyly swept across such spots as decency demanded. There were little animals, too, for one of the ladies held a swan in her arms, another was clasping the neck of the bull, others were running with hounds or fleeing from horned men. It was a white, cold, motionless world, but its shadows took on a life. And then there's this kind of next two pages where Soliman gives, in, they become animate objects. It's this, the, the servant, the Haitian servant, uh, imbues these marble European women with life. And it's the middle of 165 where he recognizes that he's thinking that Pauline Bonaparte is one of these women, and he begins to massage her, thinking that she's dead and that it's her corpse. So it's, a, it's, it's an interesting moment. I don't know if you followed it, but it's important. This Pauline Bonaparte figure is also a kind of guide through, through the novel, um, not so much as T. Noel, whom we see much more. But if you look at the m dead middle of 165, I hope you're fine. If you're not finding where I am, I think our pagination and our lines are exactly the same. It's a sentence, he had known this contact before. Do you find it in the middle of the page? With the same circular movement, he had one day relieved the pain of a twisted ankle. See, that's the, we know that that's Pauline. The substance was different, but the forms were the same. Now those nights of fear on the Ile de la Tortue came back to him when a French general, Pauline's husband, Leclerc, had lain dying behind a closed door. He recalled her whose head he had stroked to put her to sleep. And suddenly, moved by a memory not to be gainsaid, Soliman began to go through the motions of a masseur, following the structure of the muscles, the outline of the tendons, rubbing the back of the middle from the middle outward, stroking the breast muscles, tapping with a forefinger here and there. But suddenly, the chill of the marble, he's carried away. He's forgotten, it's just a statue. But suddenly, the chill of the marble rising to his wrist with such pinchers of death stiffened him with a cry. The wine in his head began to whirl. The statue, yellow in the light of the lantern, was the corpse of Pauline Bonaparte, a corpse newly stiffened, recently stripped of <coughs> breath and sight. 
which perhaps there was still time to bring back to life. So I mean, we've already been told he's been partying, he's drunk too much, but uh, this cross-cultural and cross, let's say cross-objective moment, the marble statue becomes the corpse of Pauline Bonaparte, and then the, the paragraph ends by identifying the work of art. It's the Venus of Canova. If anybody's interested, I, Carpentier was a great student of the visual arts. He was also a musicologist, a very, very great mind and very broad interests. And w I would love uh, the, some of the things he describes here, the statues and the paintings, which he describes on 164, they're, it's, they're Baroque. My guess is they probably refer to actual uh, paintings in the same way that he finally reveals exactly which statue uh, it is and by whom that um, Tino El, no, that Soliman is uh, massaging. There's a, a real visual sense here. Uh, that's why I like that passage so much about the, the Cuban church with the description, that long list of saints and Christs and so forth. That is that New World Baroque that we've talked about and that he defines, as we've seen in his essay on the Baroque and the marvelous real, that form that includes everything, that form that overarches cultures as contradictory as they, they may be. At least that's the argument. So I wanted to remind you of that scene, but um, let's maybe I'll, I'll spare you walking you through with such detail. Let's just think about then how the the novel ends. It's the next chapter, which is page 169, where T. Noel again appears. We left him enslaved building Henri Christophe's citadel. But now here he comes again, and we hear that he's, he's gotten away, and he's um, now he's among the ringleaders in the sack of the palace of Sans Souci. You see, we saw Henri Christophe in cap capture him, and now what we learn obliquely is Henri Christophe, whose palace is Sans Souci, has been sacked by the slaves, well, the freed slaves, by the Africans who no longer are tolerating this cycle of violence. So it's revolution after revolution after revolution in this novel, but we infer, and that's where next time I, I maybe on, even on the website yet, I'll post a short history of Haiti, or I ask you to look it, look it up because there is this amazing mess, this amazing disorder caused by the French Revolution in the Caribbean and the independence movements that came out of that revolution. The French were very active in the Caribbean during the time of the revolution in France. As I've told you, the storming of the Bastille, 1789, July 14th. Just keep that in mind, that date, 1789, as the beginning of the French Revolution, as our 1776 is the beginning of the American Revolution. Um, so those, that period of 20, 30 years where the Americas finally get rid of the colonizers. They don't get rid of tyranny, alas. That's the point of this book. Okay, so we see T. T, T Noel here. He sacked the Palace of Sans Souci. Henri Christophe is gone, in other words. And it's a very nice... Um, a nice scene. He sacks Sans Souci and brings the things back to the ruins of the old manor house where he was once a slave the family of Le Normand, right? We, we're told that. And so the spoils of the decolonization, if you want, or the independence of Haiti. And what, what does it get him? Well, he has a little place. He, he sits on the, uh, the books and so forth. You'll remember how that, how that passage goes. It's ironically titled The Royal Palace. It's the Royal Palace of T. Noel with things he's... Um, Stolen. Now, anybody want to go and you do the very last part? You remember how this, this now goes from here? We're in T. Noel's head, aren't we? Everybody remember the ending of this? I know this has been a, a kind of disjointed discussion of this novel because we had our two-week web project in between. You may have <laughs> read this long enough ago to not remember. But T. Noel recalls Macandal. 
that fellow we saw fly away from the colonial oppressors, at least from T. Noel's point of view, right? And so he thought on page 178, we're told six lines down, that he thought of Macandal, that he comes to his mind as he's kind of a survivor here, you know? Uh, against all all probability he's still here he's got the, the the ruins of empire around him making him somewhat comfortable really and but his his and it's a kind of liberating moment here because he look at Look what Makandal has mentioned, and we'll go through it here. In as much, you see six lines down, in as much as human guise brought with it so many calamities. Human guise. He doesn't say, well, I'm a man and men have lots of trouble. He says, well, this particular form of me is really a problematic one. He says, in, as, in so much as human guise brought with it so many calamities, it would be better to lay it aside for a time and observe events on the plain that is, on, uh, in Haiti, in some less conspicuous form. Once he had come to this decision, T. Noel was astonished at how easy it was to turn into an animal when one had the necessary powers. In proof of this, he climbed a tree, willed himself to become a bird, and instantly was a bird. He watched the surveyors from the top of a branch digging his beak into the violated flesh of a meddler. The next day he willed himself to be a stallion. And he was a stallion, but he had to run off so as fast as he could from a mulatto who tried to lasso him and geld him with a kitchen knife. He turned himself into a wasp, but he soon tired of the monotonous geometry of wax constructions. He made the mistake of becoming an ant, only to find himself carrying heavy loads over interminable paths under the vigilance of big-headed ants who reminded him unpleasantly of Le Normand de Mézy's overseers, Henri Christophe's guards, and the mulattoes of today. At times, a horse's hooves destroyed a column of workers, killing hundreds of them, meaning ants. He's still in his ant mode, so that's not useful. A horse can step on you. When this happened, the big-headed ants straightened out the file again, retraced the path, and all went on as before, in the same busy coming and going. As T. Noel was there in disguise and did not for a moment consider himself one of the species, he took refuge by himself under his table, which that night was his shelter against a steady drizzle that filled the fields with the hay-like odor of wet rushes. Now that's masterful writing. I don't know if you get into it, but and I don't. I, I hate to read the whole book aloud. But when you read it aloud, you see, it's beautifully translated. Harriet de Onis, an early uh, translator of Latin American fiction, well translated, and. It's nicely done, this move into t and You don't say, oh, this is corny. At least I don't. Maybe you all do. I'll get your opinion in a minute. But it's, it's the mind of a person who lives in an animistic universe, a world where the boundaries between human and other, which is so Western, don't exist, that the tree is animated as is the, are, as are, it's not just animals either, um, that the, the world the self is in the world in a very different way. And I think Carpentier um, gives us the feel of that self in that, in that passage. Now let's just go forging on here to the end. There's a, there's a group of geese. He makes himself a goose. Remember, go to 184. He's now speaking to the geese that are walking through. Look at the very top of 184. He presented himself without proper family background before geese who could trace their ancestry back for generations. In a word, he was an upstart, an intruder, a new goose, as it were. T. Noel vaguely understood that his rejection by the geese was a f punishment for his cowardice. Macandal had disguised himself as an animal for years to serve men, not to abjure the world of men. It was then that the old man, resuming his human form, this is 184, six or eight lines down, had a supremely lucid moment. He lived for the space of a heartbeat, the finest moments of his life. He glimpsed once more the heroes who are revealed to him, who reveal, had revealed to him the power and fullness of his remote African forebears, making him believe in the possible germinations that the future held. He felt countless centuries old. He finally can cross back over that colonizing history to a more real history, at least for him. Romanticized, perhaps, but felt. You know, this idea of felt history. It, it's embodied history. He, he lives it. 
then this beautiful passage, a cosmic weariness as of a planet weighed with stones fell upon his shoulders, shrunk by so many blows, sweats, revolts. T. Noel had squandered his birthright, and be despite the abject poverty to which he had sunk, he was leaving the same inheritance he had received, a body of flesh to which things had happened. Now he understood that a man never knows for whom he suffers in hopes. He suffers in hopes and toils for people he will never know, and who in turn will suffer and hope and toil for others who will not be happy either. You can start to hear the violins, you know, in the background. This is kind of that crescendo of a moment of hopefulness. He has a moment of insight. He's connected to the past so he can think about the future. There's something, there's something um, decisive about this moment. It, it has been argued by some that it's too easy. It's not one that suddenly this moment of insight is a little romantic in and of itself after all of the, the terrible events that we've seen in the novel. But let's go with it for a moment. That We'll just stop at the top, start at the top of 185. He will never know, and who in turn will suffer and hope and toil for others who will not be happy either, for man always seeks a happiness far beyond that which is meted out to him. But man's greatest c greatness consists in the very fact of wanting to be better than he is, in laying duties upon himself. In the kingdom of heaven there is no grandeur to be won in as much as there all is an established as there all is an established hierarchy. The unknown is revealed, existence is infinite, there is no possibility of sacrifice, all is rest and joy. That's, he's now referring to the last book of the Bible called Apocalypse or Revelation, where the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom, uh, sorry, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of this world are described. Remember in the book of Revelation, the world ends and the chosen are saved. 144,000, the bodies of those who've been in pur purgatory are brought up to heaven, and the new Jerusalem is described. So this is a, a utopian vision here at the end, but what is he saying? He's saying in the kingdom of heaven it's all been decided. Everything is measured and perfect. He says, but the kingdom of this world, the title of the book, is the one that T. Noel is occupying, that he understands that it'll never be finished. The project is never finished. It can't be known. It can't be counted. So it's a kind of oddly anti-Christian invocation of Christian ideology here in the title of the book, and this is where it cashes out. This is where we find out why this is called this. I mean, you must have wondered, and you, when you get here, you, you have a hypothesis anyway as to what Carpentier has in mind. So start again with that sentence, in the kingdom of heaven. Now, as opposed to the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of T. Noel, in the kingdom of heaven, there is no grandeur to be won, inasmuch as there all is an established hierarchy. The unknown is revealed, existence is infinite, there is no possibility of sacrifice, all is rest and joy. You say, well, that sounds good, but he's saying, no, no, the kingdom of this world is more interesting. For this reason, bowed down by suffering and duties, beautiful in the midst of his misery, capable of loving in the face of afflictions and trials, man, you see, not just T. Noel, now Carpentier, the violins have reached their crescendo, uh, man finds his greatness, his fullest measure only in the kingdom of this world. So what, he's, what Carpentier wants to do here is toy at least with a utopian vision that isn't one of an afterlife, that's where the promise paradise awaits. It's the possibility of a kingdom of heaven on earth. So this shift to man, which you know, seems universalizing, it seems to impose a kind of vision upon on T. Noel. Nonetheless, well, there it is. You can either take it or leave it, but this is what Carpentier means by the kingdom of this world. A problematic place, a troubled place, a place where people don't know what they want, can't get what they want, don't know whom they're working for, don't know what they're suffering for, and yet let's celebrate that. That's what he's saying, I think. So then about two more, well, one more paragraph for the novel, and then we'll, I'll ask you to say something, goodness. <laughs> um, what happens? This is the night of the revolution against Henri Christophe. We've seen he's already sacked the palace, so Henri Christophe is on his way out. But we we're hearing about the conch shells of the hills and the coast that sang together. We know what that means. It's like sometimes a drum isn't just a drum. Remember the French uh, Le Normand 
comes to realize, and here conch shells aren't just conch shells, the revolutionaries, the African revolutionaries are communicating with each other. I guess we just better read the whole paragraph. I promise after that I won't read any more. Let's just finish it off. There's no point in my paraphrasing it why. Let's just read it um, in the wonderful translation of Carpentier's wonderful Spanish. T. Noel climbed upon his table, scuffing the market tree with his calloused feet. He's still out in his little his little haven, you know, it's, it's very ironic, marquetry, you know, inlaid wood. This is a fancy table with his bare, he scuffed it with his calloused feet. You see that, the paradox there, obviously. Toward the cop, the sky was dark with the smoke of fires as on the night when all, as on the night when all the conch shells of the hills and coast had sung together. Sorry, that's in the past tense. That's the night of the revolution against Henri Christophe that's already passed. The old man hurled his declaration of war against the new masters, ordering his subjects to march in battle array against the insolent works of the mulattoes in power. At that moment, a great green wind, and I want you to think about the end of a hundred years of solitude. The great green wind blowing from the ocean swept the Plain du Nord, spreading through the Dondon Valley with a loud roar, a green wind. And while the slaughtered bulls bellowed on the summit of Le Bonnet de l'Eveque, the armchair, the screen, the volumes of the encyclopedia, this is all of the stuff he's surrounded with, the music box, the doll, and the moonfish rose in the air as the last ruins of the plantation came tumbling down. That's where T. Noel is, the, the last, this wind is sweeping through. The trees bowed low south Top southward, roots wrenched from the earth, and all night long the sea turned to rain, left trails of salt on the flanks of the mountains. From that moment, T. Noel was never seen again, nor his green coat with the salmon lace cuffs, except perhaps by that wet vulture who turns every death to his own benefit, and who sat with outspread wings drying himself in the sun, a cross of feathers, which finally folded itself up and flew off into the thick shade of Bois Caiman. So in the end, there's a kind of, you know, the violins come to a crescendo, and two paragraphs later, indeed one, T. Noel seems to be swept away. The last presiding presence in this novel is a vulture. What do vultures do? They eat dead people. They eat raw, dead meat. So, so there's a kind of ambivalence, and that's why David Mickick's essay is quite interesting. He's talking about the kind of ambivalence in, in both Walcott and Carpentier, where there's a hope of regeneration, there's a hope of finding a Latin American source that isn't in the colonized uh, Latin America, and at the same time blowing it all away at the, at the end. He could have stopped without those last two paragraphs. It's a very interesting decision that he made to continue on. And I, I feel certain that the biblical wind that sweeps away Macondo is quite indebted to the green wind that sweeps away uh, T. Noel. It would seem uh, too obvious not, not, not to be so. A kind of homage, if you want, to Carpentier. Okay, I'm done with this. Now I want to hear what you have to say, please, if anyone would like to comment. I notice some of you don't have your books with you, and I'm sorry I'd consider that my fault. I should have made it clearer that you needed to bring those. I know we're officially onto tracks, and we're going to get there uh, in about 10 or 15 minutes, but I'm interested in your take on this, this novel. Any comments in general? Was it pers did you like it? Let me start there. After having read the essays, Ruth, do you, you, you nodded there a bit. Do you have, what do you, what's your take on this book? Uh, I mean, it's a very different thing from Borges, certainly a different thing from Garcia Marquez, but toying at least with the same Garcia Marquezian terms, I think. Tell us what you, what I, you saw. I liked it very much. I thought um, I enjoyed it much more than Borges. Yeah. Um, but it's very different. I still, I, I'm still, I think, most connected to Gabriel Garcia Marquez, mm -hmm. but I definitely can see. Um, how Carpentier is really connected to, uh, or Marquez is connected yeah. to Carpentier, and I thought, 
I think for some reason I almost like the setting of this novel a little better than yeah. a condo. Because it's more realistic, isn't it? This is right. a, I mean, there are magical real moments, certainly, but they're all tied to the perspective of the African um, slaves or recently liberated slaves, whereas somehow the magic is more integrated into the, the mestizo world, if you want, of Macondo. It, it, there's not the kind of cultural clash. It's somehow the world itself generates that kind of energy. So the magic comes from, I think, a very different spot, and the real is more real. Um, th that's Carpentier's great interest is, I think, and I, I think I talked about it a bit last time, this idea of um, history as the source of the real. And he says, I mean, sorry, history is the source of the magic, that the real history is itself generative of, of magic. And he says it in his essays, and I read a couple of the passages last time where he does that. And I think that because it's the um, real is more real, mm -hmm. it, the magical seems so much more magical. Yeah. So I, I thought that was another thing. In, in this, in this yeah. novel, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're more persuaded by a cultural perspective that allows a man to fly away from being burned at the stake because we know it's grounded in actual cultural belief systems than when we watch Remedios the Beauty, another flying object, um, going for, for no particular reason. And you'll remember at that point I say, oh yes, but think of all of the levitating beauties in Christian iconography. Think of the Assumption of the Virgin. Think of the saints and so forth. The, the, it's, you could say, well, that Remedios the Beauty's cultural source is counter-Reformation Catholicism, Baroque images of flying women. Um, so we, we can't say that Garcia Marquez is less culturally based, but it's a very less, it's less explicitly so, I think. Yeah. That's what you're saying. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Other comments about, about this novel, maybe in comparison to others that we've, we've read? I mean, are you done, Bruce, other things to say? Has it been so long since you've read it that it's kind of vague to you? Or, yeah, Richard, would you push your button there? I actually read this back in August. Oh, I good. wanted to get ahead on my reading, so uh, oh, what reading hurt it, you? <laughs> reading, a, reading it ahead of time without I did without even knowing what the class really was going to be about. Um, at the time, I didn't really know what to make of it, but mm -hmm. I enjoyed the read. I thought it was a good yeah. book anyway, yeah. and uh, I didn't even really notice the magical aspect of it because it seemed so integrated yeah, into that's the interesting. culture. Yeah, mm -hmm. that so. is interesting. Mm -hmm. And did it send you to your encyclopedia or to the web to look up Haitian history at all? I mean, did you, was that an impulse? This is so historical. <laughs> it was all an these impulse guys. I ignored. Oh. <laughs> yeah, okay, I accept that. <laughs> I hope you won't ignore it for the final, but I, now I have to do some homework myself and get you, so, get you some sort of uh, thing up on the web that, or a link to a site that'll um, allow you not to ignore it anymore. Um, who else? Anybody else about this novel? Yeah, Anne, press your button, will you? It's a bit of ways away from you there. My question is, um, are we supposed to believe Yeah, see, that's very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we're asked to entertain that possibility. Um, let's look at it again. Indeed, um, we've seen him be all sorts of animals, it, including a sad. bird. The way it's written, that no one else saw his jacket except for maybe the vulture. So yeah. was the vulture eating him in his jacket, or was he the vulture? I, I think it's easier to read it as the former, that the vulture was finishing him off, but the latter is certainly allowed in the context of this worldview. So thank you very much for bringing up that ambiguity. I was, I was not bringing that out. I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. Yeah. Yeah, Norma? I think my favorite part was when he turned into a goose. Yeah. Because <laughs> even then he... Um, I think throughout the novel there seemed to be a sense of solitude with Tino. Yeah, speak speak a little louder, Norma. There's all this uh, buzzing going on on this side I'm of the, sorry. the room. Um, I was saying that my favorite part was when he turned into a goose and um, 
throughout the novel, it seemed to me that he, there seemed to be a sense of solitude with T. Noel, and he didn't really, um, even with the goose, with the geese, he, um, he was still not a part of them, even though when he was a human, it seemed like if um, he would be able to, um, to be part of them, but when he turned into one, he, he still wasn't. Yeah, yeah, they rejected him. He, doesn't ha he didn't have the right lineage. He was an upstart goose, um, we're told. Yeah, that's kind of a nice point, thank you. He is a very solitary figure, isn't he? We never see him as, as anything other than someone's pawn until the very end when he does set up shop, he sets up housekeeping with the things that he's taken from Sans Souci. Um, but certainly he's a very solitary figure. Much more, I mean, we don't see him talking to anybody other than the animals. And then when he becomes a goose, you're right, we skipped over that part, well, one of the few parts we skipped over, but when he becomes uh, the goose, he, he tries for community and it doesn't work. So he ends up absolutely alone. I, I think that's right, yeah. The one place where you might want to play a bit with that ambiguity or, or find a bit of ambiguity is he's very much in touch with the gods. You know, he's, that for him is his company in a sense. Oh, he says it's good, the cultures that have these war gods, we needed, needed them and so forth. So there, there, I mean, one might say that there's something there that's a mitigating circumstance, but one doesn't sense it very strongly. Other comments? Yeah, Chris, push yeah. your button. On the, on the 104, when you mentioned it, it made yeah. me think about the, the Carpentier essay. Uh-huh, tell and, me. Let's uh, look at 104. Hang on. And what he meant about the, uh, the, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. the Baroque in America. Yeah. Because the way, you know, in, in interpreting Baroque as saying um, the Counter-Reformation and yeah. the Catholicism, yeah. um, trying to recruit new members. By uh, by allowing its lines to become more ambiguous. Yes, thank you. That's very interesting. And then yeah. here it, it, you see a direct example of that in prayer songs. So like the Virgin Mary was like the old uh, river goddess of the Phoenicians. Yeah, you know, yeah, right. Things like that. Yes, yeah. Same thing. Thank Just you very much. That's a great point. Um, as I've as we've agreed, and I've talked to you about the New World Baroque, and now we've seen the essay called the Baroque and the Marvelous Real. The Baroque has become in the mid, well, early to mid 20th century, a kind of ideology of identity, a cultural form that is imposed, it was imposed by the colonizers, but is taken over by the colonized, and there's this concept of contra conquista, counter conquest. And here's a moment of counter conquest, exactly, the scene where you have the, the, in, the African priests in a kind of well, taking on the identity of the conquerors, but doing it for subversive purposes. So this is absolutely a new world Baroque moment. Thank you very much. Um, and we, we've seen others too, but mainly we see a kind of tension between the cultures, but here you see the uh, conflation of those cultures as the Negro priests untontured and unordained. Well, what kind of a priest is unordained? Not a non-priest. You have to be ordained to be a priest if you're you know, playing the game straight, um, who were known as the fathers of the savannah, and they came to praying in Latin at the palate of the dying. They were as learned as the French piece, but they made themselves better understood. That's a, yeah, yeah. So the, the, the New World Baroque uh, takes the language of the colonizers, recodifies it into a language of counter conquest, counter colonization. So when you start tossing around the term post colonial, as we do so much these days, this is a perfect post colonial novel. It's, um, it's a kind of primer of post colonialism, how one engages the colonization for purposes of postness, for purpose of, of getting over it, of getting beyond it. Um, other comments about the novel? Okay, I think we can let it lie now for a while. Um, if anyone is interested in reading more Carpentier, if you think you might write a paper on Carpentier, I would suggest uh, two other novels of his that where he's playing these same games. This is his first one, 1949. His last one he writes, his last two he writes, he dies in 1980 at a 
ripe old age. He's born in 1904, so not so ripe old, but old enough. Uh, I mean, I don't know about old enough. He dies in 1980, let me put it that way. <laughs> not old enough ever. Um, his last two novels are thin little novels that he, where he's playing with the New World Baroque and, and the ideas that we've just talked about. One is called Concierto Barroco, Baroque Concerto or Baroque Concert. In English, it's translated as Concierto Barroco. The translators leave the Spanish title. Uh, so be careful if you order it on the internet, you may get the Spanish version as I once did. Uh, it's out of print, of, uh, it is out of print, but it's been translated and it's a nice, um, a nice companion volume to this one. Not about Haiti, it's about Cuba. At the end, it's about music, as you can guess from the title. There's that, and then there's another, his very last one called The Harp in the Shadow, which is about Christopher Columbus. And it's about the historical moment when in the mid-19th century, someone decides in the Catholic Church that Christopher Columbus should be canonized. And so it's about the pope that's trying, or that is involved in the canonization. We know because we don't, St. Christopher is another Christopher, not St. Christopher Columbus. Um, it doesn't happen, it doesn't pass the, uh, the process in, in Rome, but you have the ghost of Columbus and it's a reconsideration of the conquest of, of America. So both of those novels I think you might be interested in if you want to pursue this very important writer. Um, by the way, our papers are due, it was a month from Tuesday, last Tuesday, it's now less than a month. You are beginning, I trust, I know you've just cooled off from your web papers, but I trust you're beginning to think about topics for um, final papers. If you need help with that, you don't have to decide quite yet. I will. I hope I've put it on the syllabus. If I haven't, I'll advise you. I do like to have a paragraph or two a couple weeks ahead of time, or I'll set the date when the time comes, a statement of what you intend to do. So that if I know things that will help you, sources that might be useful, uh, approaches that would be good, or if I think you can't do that paper in seven to 10 pages. Uh, in other words, I want to just put a little check at the bottom and say, good idea, carry on. Um, so do be thinking about papers. I encourage, I'm a comparatist, as you know, I, my PhD is in comparative literature. Um, and what I compare, as you know, from this course is US and Latin American fiction. But I always, as a comparatist, I have found myself, and I think you might find, that it's easier to talk about two books than one, or two authors than one, or two anythings than one, because then you have the comparison and the contrast to discuss, and you see the one thing in terms of the other, and, you're, and it can be also the visual arts and verbal if you choose to do that. Um, so think about a, a chorus, a polyphony paper. I think you'll find it easier. It's not that you have to know more. It is that you, you'll find the differences and the similarities. I mean, the last novel we'll read in the course, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, Isabella Allende. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, there, that's a very interesting paper to, com I mean, novel to compare with Garcia Marquez because it begins by feeling very derivative from 100 Years of Solitude. It ends being something else, uh, so forth. Well, you'll have your ideas about what you like. And some of you will perhaps engage some of the research you've done for your web paper on your final paper. But um, it's, the two things are quite separate enterprises. Nonetheless, maybe some of the research you've done would be useful. I, I haven't looked at your sites yet. Um, and I'm looking forward to doing that, by the way. I'm just too busy. Somehow, I haven't gotten to it. Um, any questions or comments about the, that looming assignment? Yeah, and press your press your button. It's the last day of class, second of December. Mm -hmm. If you get it to me earlier, that's great. I even will read rough drafts. If you get it to me before Thanksgiving, give you some suggestions. If you know you have problems with writing, take your rough draft to the writing center, you now know where it is, and have someone read it through, give you some suggestions about sentence structure, paragraph structure, if you happen to know that you need that kind of work. Some of you know very well you don't need that kind of work. So, um, but it's good to just start thinking about the paper, otherwise it gets to be too last minute and you can't write a good paper the night before it's due, period, according to me. Yeah, Megan, just push your button. Um, just as kind of a, a reference in paper writing, are we going to be getting our midterms? Oh, yes, you're going to get those to on Tuesday. I'm sorry. Okay. You should have gotten them 
this Tuesday, but I just I read parts of them. I read yours. I've read yours. <laughs> but I haven't read them all, and I don't like to, to turn them back before I have them all. So, oh, yeah, no, very important. And I will do, because that was a, a take home, and I have my other classes, midterms back, they also had a take home. I will correct syntactical matters, because if I see that you're weak on sentence fragments or comma usage, I'll say, check, check that out. And it, part of the grade goes for that. But the midterm, it's, it's as it's, well, it's form and content, uh, much more so than if you'd written it in a blue book where you scratch out and so forth. So, no, you'll get those back. Uh, my apologies that they aren't back yet. Yeah, Kathy? So we're pushing, as far as um, what we're doing in class, we're pushing everything back again, right? Well, we're, we're we've fallen a bit behind. I think we can catch up by the end. But what we're going to do for sure is have the quiz on tracks on Tuesday. And so I want to just start a little bit on tracks now. And we'll just see how, how we do. Um, I think I've left on the syllabus one day for review for the final. I'm going to give you a review sheet for the final. Um, my theory of testing is if you know what to study for, you're going to study more intelligently than if you're just sort of trying to wonder, guess, second guess what the teacher is going to ask. So uh, I, I like to give um, you know areas in which to prepare. Yeah. William? Is the uh, final cumulative? Or? You know what? I, you're, so far, the exams I've read are so good, <laughs> that uh, the midterms, that is, that I'm thinking not. I'm thinking I'm going to, that I might be a shorter final, and we might as well not beat our brains out too much, because you really did do a great, well, the ones I've read so far, now we, it could go downhill, but I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. I, I think it's, I never have given a take-home midterm before, and I've decided it's a great idea. It's more work for you, and it's more work for me, because so many of you wrote so much, but it, it gives you a chance to really think interestingly. I don't know why I haven't done that before. So I'm kind of thinking not, but I'm going to reserve my absolute decision for later, if that's okay. Yeah, it's a lot to go back over. It's a lot to go back over. Okay, any other? Yeah, Ify? Is there a write-up about, write about the paper? Um, no, on I haven't or? other than at the bottom of the syllabus, I say seven to ten pages. But I, let me tell you what I've said. And then if you need to know more, I'll certainly give you more. I'm not sure that you will. Hang on. I have the syllabus right here. Have I told you, by the way, that our final is December 9th, 11 to 2? Yes, you know that. Good. Final paper, 7 to 10 pages of literary critical analysis on a topic that engages magical realism in selected works. And I put S around, I mean, I put a parentheses. It could be a work or works of fiction with the possibility of extending your discussion to the visual arts and or film. You may use information from your web project, but you may not repeat yourself. Do you want to know more than that? If he, it's a it's a standard term paper, written in paragraphs with a coherent beginning, middle, and end. It's not your five paragraph essay. That's not what I'm talking about. But I do expect an introduction that tells me what and how what you're going to talk about and how you're going to approach it. And I expect a conclusion that doesn't just repeat what I've just read. I hate those kinds of conclusions. I get, as you have seen, da, da, da. no, I just saw that. What conclusions, <laughs> <laughs> conclusions are for is to draw your material, draw something out of your material. The question to ask yourself is, what do I now know, or what does my reader now know that she didn't know or he didn't know before I wrote what I've just written? So, so your conclusion is a way of, pulling the, the juice out of your material and saying, so what? So you answer the question, so what? I also say about paper topics that you have to think in terms of asking, answering a question. So you say, what is the question you're asking? Well, the question I'm asking is how Carpentier handles a, the Caribbean context in terms of the meetings and mixings and collisions of cultures. So I'm going to look at the issues of cultural syncretism in his work. That, that's the question. What the question is, how is cultural symbiosis and syncretism represented in this novel? Now I'm going to find certain scenes. I mean, that's a slam dunk. We just did it. You probably want to do more than, <laughs> more than that. But um, if I'm free associating, does any of this help you? Yeah. OK. Other comments? Megan, yeah? Not on the, not on the 
Yeah, yeah please ask. Yeah. Yeah, well, see, everything's gotten pushed back. So, so I think it'll be the following, and we're just going to have to figure out, we may have to um, make very, I've given one whole day to the Gabrielle Foreman essay. We may just do that in about five minutes. It's a, it's a good essay on Isabel Allende comparing, you'll see a good comparative essay there, comparing Isabel Allende's House of the Spirits to Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon. But you see there, we can find, we can find ways, I think, to save some, some time. And even the, my essay at the end might be um, something I would leave, leave you to do on your own. So I think we'll catch up. But everything's pushed back a week now. Yeah, so ceremony is going to be, be, we'll start that a week from Tuesday, not Tuesday. Yeah. Kathy, did you have something or that was, okay. Yeah, okay. You know what, we're getting so close to our time that I'm gonna um, stop. Some of you won't have finished tracks, finish it by Tuesday, and I, with two days on this novel, I think we can do it. Um, I am gonna ask you to do a little more of the work. I've been talking too much, trying to catch up, but um, come prepared with questions and comments about the text on Tuesday. See you then. <laughs>